Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about Earth systems. Topic for the day is going to be urban sprawl, and before we even get going, I'm going to warn you, this is something I'm a bit nerdy about, so if I talk a bit much, my apologies. As always, let me get you some objectives. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the characteristics of urban, urban sprawl and explain factors that lead to urban sprawl. So that's what we've got. I need to define a couple of uh, terms for you before we get going. So let's talk about the suburbs and the exurbs. Suburbs are areas of a city that are outside of the main metro area and are connected to the main city by large feeder roads. So if you were to draw a little diagram, you say for your city, here's the downtown and main residential area. You got a big feeder road, and then you got a suburban area out here. Suburbs are kind of like, but not the same as an exurb. Exurbs, here's your main city area. Let's say we've got our suburb out here. Exurbs are areas that are built outside of the main city, but not necessarily connected to the main city. The reason we're talking about suburbs today is that over the last 50 years or so, they have accounted for 90% of urban growth in America. So as our cities have grown, most of that growth has been out in suburban and exurban areas. And we're going to talk about why that is throughout our video today. You need to know by definition what urban sprawl is. Urban sprawl technically is a, bl is a blurring of lines between urban and rural areas. So this is where a city grows from the downtown area and then outward and outward and outward and it starts to grow into country areas and to farmland areas and there are some specific like development characteristics of urban sprawl but basically you could think of urban sprawl as being like a bug that got smashed maybe traditionally your city was a nice circular layout that included your downtown area in the center and then some housing around it or a square with your downtown area in the middle and then housing around it Urban sprawl makes it look more like a bug got squished, where there's like your old downtown area and the housing that was around it, but then you get all of these areas that start to grow out into farmland and into forest land and into desert and prairie land, and everything just kind of starts to spread out all over the place. So technically, that's what urban sprawl is. Now, there are some characteristics of it that you need to know, and I'm going to bet that once I start talking through all this, you're going to recognize a lot of it, but here are the things you need to know about urban sprawl. Um, suburban areas generally have low population density, which means that there are very few people living in a large amount of land. Your housing is in clusters, so rather than having like nice city blocks that are all on a grid and people are living relatively close to each other, you've got subdivisions or gated communities where there's just a chunk of houses. They all usually look alike. They were built by the same developer, and they're in one area, and they're kind of their own contained little community. You've got office parks, which rather than having traditional offices in like high-rise buildings downtown, you've got these parks of a bunch of small, low-lying office buildings all kind of clustered together in one area. Because everything is spread out all over the place, you've got miles and miles of roads connecting things. So because people aren't able to walk to offices or stores or whatever because they live in these little developed neighborhoods, you have to have roads. And you also have got to have like a big major road or two connecting the suburban area to the main downtown city area. Usually suburban areas will have lots of big box stores. So there's things like Walmart and Big Lots and Home Depot and Lowe's and Kohl's and all that stuff. Um, with giant parking lots. So you're not thinking about land space when you start going out into suburban areas because there's tons of land. So you just build these big old shopping centers that sprawl out across the land. And rarely are suburban sprawl areas, or the suburbs, sorry, rarely are the suburbs walkable. It's not like you can walk out your house and walk to the grocery store or the local shop or whatever else. You have to drive to get to whatever you need to get to. So as the city sprawls out across the countryside, there are some pretty significant urban uh, environmental impacts that you need to know about. The first major environmental impact that you need to know about is suburban residents drive twice as much or twice as many miles as urban dwellers. And this makes sense because out in the suburbs, things are not, like I said, walkable. So you have to drive to go to the store, to go hang out, to go to the movies, to go to the mall, to go eat. Um, if you want to do something in the main city, let's say there's something downtown you want to go do, you got to drive there. Whereas if you live in the city center or in the main urban area, you should or usually will be able to walk to most things. So suburban residents drive twice as many miles as urban residents. 
Second, suburban lots are much larger than urban lots. So out in the suburbs, you got tons of land. So you can usually get a really big house with a really big yard around it where within the city, you know, there's uh, land constraints. You don't have room to do that. So lots out in the suburbs generally use more land. And as you're using up land, then you are taking farmland and converting it to residential use. You are also destroying what might have been forest habitat or prairie habitat or, like I said, farmland. So as these big lots grow out and just kind of spread all over the place, they eat up land that would have either been habitat for animals or farmland for people. And as the city grows out across the farmland, that pushes farms further and further away from the main city, which means that food has to travel further to get into the city, meaning more miles driven, more gas used, and more carbon dioxide emitted. With urban sprawl, we got to talk about the causes, because that's really kind of the main thing in this video, is what actually causes urban, urban sprawl. And there are four things I'm going to talk about. The first one is transportation. Second one is living costs. Third is urban urban blight and the fourth is government policy. Once we've gone through those, that'll be our day. So first driver of urban sprawl is going to be automobiles and highways. And here's the deal. When highways started being built in the 50s and 60s and cars became more readily available, for the first time in history, people were able to get the benefits of living in the country, meaning that they could have a larger house in a quiet neighborhood, small community in the suburbs, but they could still work within the city. So you could drive into the city, spend your day working in your office, then drive out to your quiet big house in the country. So this process of being able to drive back and forth and the ease of being able to drive back and forth made people a lot more willing to develop living areas outside of the city because no longer did you have to walk into your workplace or ride a horse or a cart or a buggy or a trolley or anything like that. So people were able to have the benefits of living in the country and still enjoy hanging out in the city whenever they wanted to. So that's the first thing, automobiles and highways made that transition back and forth very easy, so it became more, I guess, feasible to build out in the suburbs. Second thing is living cost. Because there is so much land out in the country, the cost of land is generally going to be lower. So it is not uncommon for the cost of a one-bedroom condo in the downtown area of a city to cost about the same as a five-bedroom house with a giant yard out in the suburbs. Um, that's just kind of how it goes, supply and demand. There's demand for those houses or those condos down in the city, so people are going to pay as much for one of those small condos as they would for a really big house with a yard out in the suburbs. So due to the difference in living costs, a lot of people will migrate out to the suburbs because they can get more space for the money. But we need to recognize this doesn't apply to everyone. This applies with people that have enough money to be able to purchase, you know, a single family home. Single family homes just like a freestanding home like you see in the picture there rather than a condo, a townhouse, or an apartment. But anyway, people that make that jump from the urban area out to the suburbs have the money to purchase a house. If you are someone who does not necessarily have the money to purchase a house out in the suburbs, then you are stuck living in the city. So this is something that, you know, people that have got more means are able to do, while those who don't, they are stuck living in the city and they're not able to move back out or out to the suburbs. And this process drives something called urban blight, which I find to be a fascinating process. Um, if we are going to technically define it, urban blight is degradation of the built and social environment that accelerates migration. Um, and it also accentuates inequality. I'm going to talk about it in a second. But let me walk you through this process. It's a positive feedback loop where as the loop goes on, it actually makes the uh, loop get worse. So here's where it starts. It starts with your population moving to the suburbs. People are making money, suburbs are being developed, so people are starting to move out to the suburbs. As people move out to the suburbs, the city gets less, less tax money because a lot of the city's tax revenue comes from people paying property taxes, sales taxes, taxes on services. So while people were living here in the urban area, they were paying their bills here in the urban area, which means that there were taxes for the urban area, and those taxes were able to support things like police and public transit and sanitation and all that stuff. So as people move out of the city, their money goes with them. Because their money goes with them, services get cut. And as those services get cut, this means that police resources go down, fire resources go down, um, the quality of uh, public transportation goes down, all of those services start to be reduced, and sometimes the city will have to raise taxes to try to uh, get more money. Because the services are being cut and the downtown area is becoming less desirable, 
fewer customers are coming to this downtown area, which means that any businesses that were down here are losing business such that they have to start shutting down. So the businesses in the downtown area start shutting down and disappearing. And because there are no businesses in the area, you don't have people coming into the area, which means that there's little incentive to keep the area up and the neighborhood starts to decline. As those neighborhoods decline, then more people move out towards the suburbs and the process just keeps going and going and going and going. Now, there's a difficulty in all of this. Um, in the 50s and 60s, it was generally middle class and upper middle class white communities that were able to leave for the suburbs. And that became known as white flight. Um, it was historically during this time Minority communities did not necessarily have the money to be able to move out to the suburbs. So they were left in urban areas that were declining and property tax and taxes in general um, are what is used to fund schools. So as the money moved out to the suburbs, this means that the schools out in the suburbs got pretty good while the schools and the urban areas did not do well at all and were underfunded. So you get a broadening of inequality because all of the resources are moving out to the suburbs, leaving the downtown areas to kind of fend for themselves. Crime goes up, uh, sanitation goes down, it becomes an area that is not desirable to live in, so of course that drives the growth of the suburbs. And then the last thing I want to talk about today is government policy, and there are three things on this area. First one is the Highway Trust Fund, and the Highway Trust Fund was a program set up in the 50s and 60s, I think it was 1954 like or something, that basically said that road projects would be funded using tax from gasoline. Now this set up a situation called induced demand, where essentially the supply of something increases the demand. So that's how it works. You build more roads, people drive more, they use more gas, which means they pay more gas tax. If there's more gas tax, then there are more roads built, which means people drive more and they buy more gas and there's more tax. So you can see how this loop kind of goes and goes and goes. It's another positive feedback loop. So the building of roads and revenue for from gas to build more roads pushed people out or made more roads available for people to drive on, which means that the suburbs were able to grow. There's also this thing called zoning. And zoning is set up essentially so that cities can create areas of their city that are for specific purposes. So they can say, all right, let's see, we, we want business over here. We want residential area over here. We want industry over here. And in these zones, the types of things that can be built there are regulated. So you can only build factories in this area and you can only build businesses here and only houses here. So through this zoning work, it pushes residential areas to one place. And that means that you have to drive to get to all of the other stuff. Now, there are a lot of cities that are pushing for multi-use zoning. And multi-use zoning is basically saying that certain areas of land can be used for multiple things. So it says that maybe in the downtown area, you can have both business and housing and develop like a traditional main street area. So one of the answers to zoning that has traditionally segmented cities is to push for this multi-use zoning that says, hey, we're adults, we can build and use the land for multiple things at one time. And then the last thing is the Federal Housing Authority, which was a program that was set up in, I think I read 1934. And the purpose of it was to give low cost loans to people for buying houses in low risk areas. So as people were coming back from World War II, soldiers had um, really good benefits through the GI Bill and they were able to buy houses using this FHA program. The houses that they were able to buy were ones that were being mass produced out in the suburbs. So that pushed people out of cities and into the suburbs as well. So that's it. That is your crash course into urban sprawl and the causes of it. Our next video, we're going to look at uh, things that are being done to combat urban sprawl. But for now, thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite.